Gishima is connecting. Hi, Gishima. Hi. Nice to see you again. <laughs> nice to see you too. You are okay, close great. now, so we can start. Okay, sure. Let's start then. Um, just one sec. Okay. All right, start with some breathing meditation. Just being in the present. And then visualize that you're in the presence of the Buddha, who's appearing in the space in front of you. Being inseparable from your Lama or your spiritual master. showing us what we ourselves can attain, inspiring us to practice in such a way that we attain the same qualities. So the Buddha appears in the form of a fully ordained monk. Seated on a lotus seat and a sun and moon disc. That symbolizes renunciation as compassion and wisdom. I also think that you're surrounded by all sentient beings. You're in the midst in the center of endless sentient beings, all appearing as humans. With those we resent or who resent us right in front of us. And then while being aware of the fact that it is in dependence on these sentient beings that we can generate all the qualities we need to become enlightened. Remembering that the nature of their mind is not different from the nature of the mind of a Buddha. And then they all deserve to be happy and to be free from suffering. Let's generate 
affectionate love, a sincere affection, deep sense of care and acceptance. all sentient beings. And then focusing in particular on all the unwanted experiences sentient beings constantly have and focusing on the causes in particular, their misperception that generate great compassion, the wish for them to be completely free from these experiences and their causes, and not just that, but also the wish for us to be able to protect them to help them to overcome all these sufferings and their causes. Try to really feel that from the depth of your heart. And that great compassion then gives way to the altruistic attitude that is determined to do whatever is necessary. No matter how long it takes us, no matter how difficult it may be to help sentient beings overcome their sufferings, their dissatisfaction, and their causes. And since we can realistically only achieve this once we become enlightened, let's generate the sincere aspiration to become fully enlightened for the benefit of each and every sentient being. And to think that it is with this mind of enlightenment, with this motivation that we continue to study uh, Nagarjuna's text. And so let's deepen our motivation by reciting the prayer. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity, and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity, and so forth, May I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. All right. 
Okay. There we go. What's first? The lum room. Yep. Okay. So it's part of the lum room that we're slowly going through. So we've covered pretty much the first part of the practices common to a person of middling spiritual capacity. That is, we talked about suffering and its causes, basically. I'm not going to talk about the 12 links here in this context. That would take too long. But I want to talk about these next um, outlines here. So the kind of body, as it's called here, or the kind of existence that is necessary for us to actually break out of cyclic existence. What is it? Well, what kind of existence is that? Um, it's human, it's the human existence. That's how the Lumrum texts explain it. And not just an ordinary human existence, but as we all know, uh, a precious human existence. And again, it gives us the opportunity to be grateful, to rejoice in, well, most of us probably having a precious human rebirth. I mean, the fact that we are uh, capable to practice the Dharma. So when we talk about the eight leisures, the 10 endowments, it's really another way of saying we have everything we need to put into practice what we're learning here. So learning about the Dharma and then actually practicing exactly that which we've learned, which we've reflected on. And we have, therefore, all the freedoms to do so. We are, we're lacking the obstructions. Like, we, we, well, we have encountered the Dharma. We have this incredible body and this incredible situation of an intelligent mind. And although life can be difficult and we definitely have obstacles, these obstacles are not uh, grave enough or strong enough to keep us from practicing the Dharma. So to appreciate that again and be aware, we've got everything we need and then the second aspect to reflect on so as part of the first aspect or the first outline really it's just to take it to mind again we've got everything we're so fortunate of the eight billion humans just on this planet let's leave aside the animals the insects and beings from other realms but just the eight billion humans on this planet there's a few hundreds, a few thousands, well, let's let's say it's a few thousands that have that rare opportunity. I mean, just the fact we have interest in the Dharma, um, in the Buddha Dharma. So, and of course, there's a lot more to it. Anyway, um, to appreciate that once again, but also to be aware of the kind of path we need to follow. Now, as part of the practices of a person of our practices come to a person of middling spiritual capacity. Well, why are we going through that? If our goal is enlightenment, well, I, I guess as all of you know, um, before we can generate the causes for bodhicitta. So what is one of the main causes for bodhicitta? Well, it's great compassion. We go through it every time we reset the motivation. So great compassion is a mind that not only wishes for all sentient beings to be free from suffering, uh, but also wishes to protect other sentient beings from that suffering, as we all know. So we've heard it so many times. But to be free from suffering, well, first of all, we need to focus on ourselves to understand our situation, to ourselves want to be free from suffering. And here we're not just talking about uh, suffering such as, I don't know, headaches, mental pain, physical pains, and so forth, but really all that is wrong with our existence, all our limitations, our shortcomings, um, well, unwanted experiences, but even the limited experiences of cyclic existence, to want to be free of those, understanding that uh, they're in the nature of suffering. They're very limited. They have a lot of disadvantages. They just keep us. They keep us from actualizing our our real potential, and of course, from becoming liberated and enlightened in that way. So, therefore, 
Um, we need to generate, before we can generate the wish for all sentient beings to be free from these limitations, from the three types of suffering, the six types, the eight types, and so forth, focus on ourselves to develop that wish with regard to ourselves. So focusing on ourselves and wishing to be free from samsara, we then can focus on others, which is why it's so important to take that step first. So to reflect again on what we've learned and what we've studied so far about suffering, its causes, and just the fact that we're so limited and that suffering, even like the worst kind of suffering, I mean, I'm not talking about the suffering of suffering here that we experience that all the time, but it could be experienced at any moment. And we never really fully feel satisfied. I mean, full satisfaction, full peace of mind with self-cherishing is just not possible. So even without any obvious problem, even if everything is going right in our life, there will always be a sense of, uh, well, I'm not, I don't know, fear. It's not really fear, but of losing that which we have, for instance. So there's always the sense of foreboding that anything could happen, which of course is true. There's never a real sense of peace. Why? Because of self-centeredness and self-grasping. So being aware of that, and wishing to be free from that, that is the, the first step or a, a, a necessary essential step um, before we can actually generate compassion, great compassion, which we'll discuss in more detail once we get to this part of the alum room. But having said all that, while well, the kind of path here that is described, uh, or it was more than one path of the kind of practices that are prescribed, are ethical conduct, concentration, and wisdom. So it sounds pretty simple. Of course, it's more complicated than that. But just to give us a sense of what is what is the main practice of someone who wants to overcome samsara? Well, ethical conduct or ethical discipline, concentration and wisdom. So as part of ethical discipline, you could say, well, renunciation is part of that. But in general, um, it is, of course, refraining from any kind of harmful actions. So, again, to focus on that and understand, um, well, what we're doing as the first level of our practice, we, of course, deal with the causes of all our trouble. The root cause, of course, we need to address that as well. But in the meantime, when you think about the causes and conditions that give rise to suffering, well, the end result are these unwanted experiences. But what are they directly caused by? Well, they're directly caused by karmic actions. These karmic actions are then directly caused by um, certain afflictions, such as anger, attachment, and so forth, which in turn is directly caused by self-centeredness. And that, of course, is caused by our misperception. So we need to address all of those. And we start with, of course, the first step, watch our actions, to be aware of our negative actions as the first step of ethical conduct. So to be aware of how we talk, how we uh, act, are these actions harmful or not? And most importantly, of course, what is the motivation? Why are we doing what we're doing? So to observe, therefore, as part of our, our practice, be mindful, uh, apply self-introspection, I mean, generate self-introspection self um, and be aware of how we act so in order to avoid harmful actions and then of course we address the afflictive emotions as well to apply the antidotes etc so that's really the kind of path here we need to apply the the path of ethical conduct now if you pace if you spend some time meditating on that there's enough material to read through this again um, to reflect on it again but even more important than reflecting on it I mean of course we reflect on it in order to apply it but even more important is of course to apply it to pay special attention this coming week as part of our practice of the alarm room oh sorry I forgot to switch off my phone um, as part of our uh, as part of our practice of the Lam Rim to pay special attention to ethical discipline in the form of what are my actions, how am I acting physically, mentally, physically, verbally, and more importantly, 
what are my thoughts? What are my intentions? That being mental karma. What are my intentions? So to uh, do this as much as we can, and we can do this in any moment. We need to do it in any moment because every situation counts. Every situation uh, becomes a situation where we, in every situation, we create new karmic actions, new karmic, no, we create new karmic results. We create the causes for our future experiences. So to pay uh, special attention to that, but also with regard to afflictive emotions, um, again, allow not allowing them to just run wild in our mind, but when they've arisen, to note them and apply the necessary antidotes. So this is the 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 basic the basis for uh, ethical conduct or for ethical discipline which is the first of the three higher trainings. Now, as part of the Lam Rim, the, the other two trainings are not explained in, in this section. It'll be explained later on because that's just as important for the uh, the next section of the, the Lam Rim, the practices of a person of higher spiritual capacity. But then ethical discipline, that's explained in great detail here. So I'll talk more about this next week, these different points here. But um, like I said, to to pay extra attention to, of course, avoiding the ten non-virtues as part of ethical discipline, but to watch the mind even more carefully than we usually do. To always like be like a spy, to pay attention to the outside, of course, but also pay attention to our own body and mind, my body and speech, and in particular on our own mind. Okay, as part of um, the practice of ethical discipline. Great. Okay. So having talked about that, um, next is the, uh, the questions. So let me go to the questions. Where is it? Oh, yeah. Okay, so I received a few questions. I wrote them down here. You see, the first question was, I'm not so sure I'm supposed to talk about it publicly. I don't know. It didn't seem uh, that I I should talk about it. So I left out all the details that may give away uh, who who asked about this. I mean, whose question or who asked the question. I'm not going to mention the name. I don't anything where she's from okay i'd say she's female that's it but other than that i don't want to say anything but it's a really beautiful question so i highlighted some of the parts that i specifically liked um it's a it's a very good example of someone taking a situation that is so difficult i mean that is really i mean talking about being burned by fire being directly burned by fire so one of the most painful uh, injuries I, I, I could think of and trying to apply the Dharma. And so, of course, the, the whole reason for, for this class, for us learning about the Dharma, for us reflecting and meditating on this is exactly that, to apply whatever we've learned to our daily life. And what is even more difficult is to do so when we have trouble. When things are going really well for us, then Dharma practice may seem, I mean, it depends on the person. Sometimes when things go too well, we're too distracted and we're not interested in anything as boring as the Dharma. But usually like, well, it feels easy. I mean, it, it is easy. It feels easier to practice the Dharma then. But then when things go really wrong, when something extremely painful happens, to then think of the Dharma is, is I think, extremely challenging, extremely difficult. So to take that step is, is very hard. I mean, to make that a habit in the first place. But it is so effective for different reasons. I mean, first of all, it helps us to deal with the problem more effectively. That is definitely one aspect. But also, it advances our Dharma practice um, so intensely. 
I mean, we, we progress much greater, we progress much further when we do exactly that, which is why it's such a beautiful example. Anyway, I'll just read the question. So I've made a very clear, so previously she described what happens. So she was burned by open fire and uh, suffers from third degree burns um, on her body. So extremely painful, of course. And so she writes, I've made a very clear decision to not turn the physical pain into a mental pain. The first step, amazing. So oftentimes when there's physical pain, well, mentally it affects us in such a way we feel depressed, we feel unhappy. Um, so therefore, um, well, we suffer from that. We suffer mentally on top of the physical pain. So what she describes here is so amazing because of not um, of not allowing that to happen. I mean, to be sure to protect our mental well-being in such a situation. So that's the first step. And through practicing simple shamatha. Okay, so I like that she says simple shamatha. It doesn't have to be hours and hours of one-pointed concentration, but no, shamatha, of course, of mindfulness, I've mentioned uh, before, to be focused, for them to not allow our mind to totally run wild and be uncontrolled. Of course, then it's difficult to to not if not have the physical pain affect the, the the mental state so practicing shamatha in that way and also gratitude that's very beautiful so a lot of gratitude that the event didn't end worse it could have been much worse i mean of course it was already pretty bad but it could have been worse usually i mean i mean she's still alive on one hand, but also the injuries could have been worse or other people could have been affected and et cetera, et cetera. So to also look at the bright side in that situation or to count our blessings and be compassionate towards ourselves or to be compassionate towards, towards ourself. And definitely also to uh, be gentle and not be rough. And and also sometimes we blame ourselves if there was some, I don't know, some mistake involved and, and so forth. So we're really harsh with ourselves. She's avoiding that. And gratitude to the people who help her. So these are all very healthy states of mind that in such a situation, well, of course, if we can change the situation, we should. But once you've been burned, that's all you can do is wait until it's over while remembering impermanence. So amazing. I have a lot of support from friends, which makes me feel very loved. And I feel very positive and full of gratitude. Wonderful. With allowing myself to feel sad as well, of course. Yes, not to suppress certain emotions. And when sadness is there, to not suppress it, but to work with it. But the question is, I feel like I'm still burning a lot. I feel like I'm on fire. Well, yes, it makes sense. Um, and then just the physical, of course, sensation. And then she goes on to say, the doctor said it might be a post-traumatic response. So I try to let go, to feel it, to allow it, to hug me and so on. Um, so try to let it go, but also to feel it, to be with the pain, um, to, I, I guess she also means to not resist the pain in such a way that it may become stronger. Um, and medication, pain medication, other medications do not help at all. So I know it will pass. Eventually it'll go away. Yet I'm curious if there's a Buddhist practice or an adage to help me embrace that feeling, to embrace the experience, which was definitely traumatic uh, in a sense. I don't feel frightened by it, but I want to maximize a healthy attention to it in order to heal. Okay, great. That's beautiful. I mean, she's already doing so much. Uh, which I think is inspiring for anyone. I mean, even we all have problems. I mean, not these, these incredible problems, but everything she applied here is is helpful in so many other situations. But in terms of her question, what came to mind right away was the practice of Donglen. So the practice, it's a it's a practice of mind training, which of course is very suitable in this situation here, in the sense that uh, well, mind training, which is um, such that you take any kind of obstacle and transform it into Dharma practice. His Holiness will teach a, a very um, popular mind training text soon, starting on the 2nd of October. So uh, there, you, you, the, His Holiness will teach the seven-point mind training. 
Then the eight verses, of course, of mind training, uh, they also mention giving and taking. So using the breath and visualizing whenever there is the chance, visualizing that the pain, in particular in this case, this pain that is experienced, I'm visualizing, I'm taking on all the pain of all the sentient beings, all their suffering of being burned themselves, but also like, I mean, there's grief that feels like your mind is on fire. So any kind of grief, grief, suffering, to visualize that you're breathing that in and you're taking it away from other sentient beings. And likewise, destroying your own causes for any kind of suffering. So any kind of um, misapprehension of reality, self-centeredness, all that is destroyed. And then, of course, as breathing out, you visualize all your well-being, all your virtue. You give everything to other sentient beings. And in that process, it's multiplied in your own continuum. So you could start with like breathing in and taking in all the blessings of all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of all the wonderful qualities and visualize your pain is removed in that way. As you breathe out, you're breathing out this uh, healthy kind of loving um, energy, if you like, towards all sentient beings. But you can also visualize you take the suffering of, of sentient beings. If the second practice feels too difficult right now, we'll just breathe in the positive the health, the, the love and compassion of, of all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and breathe out your suffering. But most effective is really the second practice where you think you're taking on all the suffering, you're experiencing it for the benefit of all sentient beings. So, of course, you're not really doing that, but because you, you're visualizing it, it has such a powerful effect on the mind because the brain doesn't know this is not happening. You can visualize things. I mean, this this is really beautiful in terms of modern science as well. If you visualize you're playing tennis, your brain doesn't know you're not playing tennis. So the thing is um, just visualizing it. And I mean, from a Buddhist point of view, you're still practicing, you're, you're accumulating so much virtue, so much virtue in that moment because it's, it's similar to whether, okay, so not doing it is not exactly the same, but it's the mental force mental force um, is is so is so um, intense that it has a very positive effect on the mind which is why um, yeah this would be something to try and many great masters they utilize sickness in that way exactly in that way and we don't need to be great masters to do that there are examples but that's what I would um, suggest and then she also says, gratitude, people, not necessarily sangha, just feeling connected to others. That is so beautiful, this feeling of connectedness. Because in the West, we suffer a lot from loneliness. So we, it's one of the, the diseases of the 21st century. Diseases, I mean, mental kind of diseases in the sense. It, well, I don't know whether you would call it a disease, but in a, to a certain, at a certain degree, or to, when it, when it when they um, reach a certain intensity, it can actually turn into a mental disease. But anyway, we all suffer from mental diseases. The only person who doesn't is a Buddha. So therefore, um, loneliness is, is a huge aspect. And to overcome loneliness, one of the greatest antidote, antidotes are this feeling of connectedness. So if you feel connected to all of the sentient beings, you're they're part of you and you're part of them. So there's no sense of them and me, but it's like I'm just a part of them and their happiness is just as important as my own. And then there's this sense of loneliness just disappears. Because like whether you're totally alone in a room or you're with other people, you generate that connectedness and you may not have anything to talk with them about, but still on a subtler level, well, we all want the same, want to be happy, don't want to suffer. We have our mind is in the same nature of clarity and, and so forth. So in that sense, we can actually really get that sense of connectedness without talking to anyone. It's, it's, an, it's an inner feeling. And so gratitude, people, it doesn't have to be Sangha, no, anyone, anyone. It can be a dog, a cat, any animal. It can be other sentient beings. To feel that sense of connectedness is so important, so healthy. Okay. Anyway, I'm think, I think she's doing a great job in everything she said. 
and if you can keep it up, um, yeah, wow, that's true Dharma practice. True Dharma practice. So really beautiful. I wanted to share that with you. Okay, great. Then there's a question on Nagarjuna. Edward's question about emptiness of dependent arising. With the following example, okay, I need to tell you honestly, I'm stretching it a little bit on purpose. <laughs> I'm stretching it a little bit on purpose. I mean, I want you to hear this. I think the first question is so down to earth and so important in our everyday life. So I want to, first of all, I wanted to share that with you for that reason. But to be honest, I'm I'm uh, really, really busy right now with the preparations of His Holiness's teachings. We just got another message for another teaching. Um, so on the 27th of September, and there's a lot of preparation. It's it's overwhelming. But of course, His Holiness's teachings as long as we still have them, it's so important to prepare them in such a way that everyone's got the best kind of material. Uh, and in that way, we'll get the most out of the teachings and that will also have an effect on his wholeness's long life and his wholeness's health. So this is for me most important right now, at least now with the October teaching. So I don't really have time to prepare anything. And we're Towards the end, we always reach the, the end of the material we got to. Uh, anyway, so I talked with Gila about this, and her suggestion was to take more questions, not to have long breaks. But realistically, I won't have time to sit down and prepare new material until after the 4th of October. Anyway, let's see how that works. Now, I want to answer Edward's question, which is really good. Um, it's about emptiness and dependent arising. So would the following example make sense in the context of the emptiness of dependent arising to feel the dependence of a cause upon a result and not only of a result upon a cause? Okay, so let's feel this. I like how he uses the word to feel it. It's not just an intellectual sense, but to really have a a, a deep sense, yeah, it's, it's not just, of course, the result depends on the cause. Yes, I'm dependent on my parents as a cause of me. I'm dependent on my actions in the past. Yes, all that makes sense. But the other way around, that something that exists right now is dependent on something that hasn't even happened yet, that's a little harder. Okay. So his example, let's suppose that a person drank river water contaminated with toxin producing bacteria. All right, so let's visualize this river. <laughs> We've got a few rivers around where I live. So <laughs> there, there may be some toxin producing bacteria in there. So as a result, I get a belly ache. All right, Obviously, the belly ache is a result of the toxin being the cause. All right, the toxin is the cause. It's in the river. I take my cup, take some water, and I drink it and get sick. A direct cause are the toxins. Okay, so toxins in the water that I just drank. An indirect cause would be the bacteria which produce the toxin. All right, I don't know anything about bacteria, so they produce the toxin. Okay, so for if it would not produce the toxin or if it would not be there, there would be no belly ache. All right, let's assume the water was totally clean. Of course, yeah, no, no bacteria, at least no harmful ones. Yeah, I wouldn't get sick. So first you have the bacteria, they give rise to toxins. Then this toxic water, I drank that and I got a belly ache. Great, okay. So, but the toxin as a cause is also dependent on the belly ache. All right. Okay. Let's see. This is because in the river, there are plenty of fishes and other creatures on, one th on which this particular compound has absolutely no negative effect. It's true, right? So this toxin, if it were in and of itself a toxin, then first of all, everyone would get sick. Right? If it were a toxin, everyone would have to get sick. If it was in its nature, if in and of itself, independently, then everyone would get, it would be a toxin for everyone. But you could have the scenario here that no one else gets sick. So in relation to the effect it has on these fishes, it's not a toxin. 
And in fact, let's say it, 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 that this substance, this chemical would actually help some, some fishes. Well, then you would have medicine. It would be medicine. So it's a neutral compound. It is toxin and it is medicine. In and of itself, no. Because in and of itself, it wouldn't make sense. It cannot be a toxin. It cannot be harmful and beneficial at the same time in and of itself. It's only in relation to that which it affects. It's a toxin in relation to my, to my body. It's a, it's, a, it's a medicine in relation to a certain other living being. So it makes sense. So therefore... Because in the river, there are plenty of fishes, not the cream, which is particular. So who knows? In some cases, may even be beneficial. Yeah, I took that example. So toxin is a mere label dependent, depending on the result of belly ache in humans. Great. Isn't that right? That's exactly, that's exactly true. That's exactly what is meant here. So we say it's a cause. We didn't use the word, we didn't use the word toxin here, but Let's face it. Let's face it. I mean, any entity can be described in so many ways. I mean, this this compound that Edward uh, mentions, it's a physical compound. It is. It's physical. It's impermanent. It it exists, of course. It's a toxin. It is. Da, 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 there's a whole list of entity or a whole list of characteristics that it has, but none of those exist intrinsically in the object. They're all labeled in relation to phenomena other than itself. So either in relation to its parts, which are a part of it, so they're not it, they're just a part of it, or in relation to other phenomena, and even in relation to what they cause in the future. So it's a cause in general because it has a result. And to be more specific, it is a toxic cause a toxin because it results in a belly egg or it's a medicinal uh, substance or a medicinal cause because it helps other sentient beings. So in that way, it's in and of itself, neither nor. It's merely labeled on the basis on or in relation to all these other phenomena. Very good. Very good example. So I like that he chose another example it didn't just stick with cause and effect, but use something else. So that's the way to deal with it, to go around and find, find objects. I mean, think of objects where it's true that we call this a cause in relation to what it gives, or we call it this, that, and the other in relation to what it will give rise to to therefore get a sense of this mutual dependence. Mutual dependence, it's, a, it's a, a, um, a concept you find in the lower schools, yes, but not to the extreme, not to the extent you find it in the Prasangika school, that cause and effect are mutually dependent. dependent. Okay, great. All right, having said that, so uh, I think that very much answers this question. Very good. Now, Jimmy's question. Jimmy's question about being merely labeled by the mind. Okay, so he describes a few scenarios. Scenarios. So the ancient Samkhya farmer believes that there's a, already a little sunflower plant inside each seed. Mm, strictly speaking, they don't believe that, but their assumptions, their assumptions would lead to that. Remember, if I talked, when I talked about this, they said that everything arises from the same substance. A cause, such as a sunflower seed, it arises from the same uh, kind of fundamental nature as the result of the sunflower seed. Which means that they're actually, if they arise from the same thing, if they're all of, if they're all of one nature, as they would say, then cause and effect already exist. They have to exist at the same time, and therefore the result exists already in the cause. That's the absurdity that this leads to, this assumption. So anyway, if it's a little confusing what I said, maybe go back to the material um, there I explained it. But anyway, let's say, okay, th they have the sense there's already a little, well, even if they don't 
uh, philosophically believe that, but philosophically be ph philosophically believe that, but that would be the the consequence that there's already something in the sunflower seed. Then the modern day materialistic farmer believes otherwise and thinks that the seed, chemicals and, and weather together inherently, I want to add inherently produce a plant, that they intrinsically have that potential to produce a plant. It's intrinsic in them. They have this natural intrinsic entity within them or this characteristic within them that allows them to inherently give rise to a plant. So he also plants a sunflower seed, attends to it with care, water and fertilizer, and soon harvests sunflower plants. But based on the assumption it happens inherently. So without the cause existing in the, the result existing in the cause, as the Samkhya's believe, no, or as the Samkhya's, or, or, or that is based on the Samkhya's assertion. Um, but instead, inherent existence. The Madhyamika, Madhyamika Buddhist farmer, refuse all the above. So unless you, gener you, you add inherent existence to this one here, um, it, 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 they wouldn't refute this in general. This is conventionally, of course, true. So the Buddhist farmer refutes all the, 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 the Madhyamika farmer refutes all the above. He also plants a sunflower seed, attends to it with care, water, and fertilizer, and soon harvests sunflower plants. Finally, he analyzes production from self production from other, from either, and from both. From, from, from neither, no, from both, and from neither. He analyzes production from self, production from other, from both, and from neither. And comes to the conclusion that because there's no reasonable explanation of why it happened, therefore he arrives at the conclusion it must be merely labeled by mind. Hmm. Hmm. So they come, doesn't, just because he can't find an answer? Okay. All right. Because it's none of those four, then the only other option would be, well, it's been merely labeled. Is this right? Yes. Okay. So the only other option, if the other four don't apply, the fifth option would be it's merely labeled. And yes, that would be the, the Madhyamika assertion. Prasangika Madhyamika, I should specify. In that way, is the merely labeled by mind explanation any better than the explanation it's a miracle of God? Well, better in the sense of realistic. From a Buddhist point of view, this is in accordance with reality. This isn't. Now, of course, I don't want to I don't want to take anyone's belief in God or whatever. No, no, that's not the purpose of that. But just taking it from the point of view of logic, well, and here we're not talking about the, the existence of God as such, but as God creating everything, being responsible for the harvest, etc. But to Jimmy saying that the 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 sunflower that grew being a miracle of God sounds very much the same as being merely labeled by God, but by the mind. There seems to be no improvement on the theistic farmer, farmer's view. In fact, that one is actually simply, in fact, that one is actually simpler, therefore might be even preferable. If after all our lengthy analysis, all reasonable explanations make no sense, then why do we arrive at the conclusion it's merely labeled by mind? Instead of saying it's a miracle of God, where's the improvement? Well, I mean, does it make sense or not, right? It's merely labeled by mind. It's not just, oh, it's none of the other four. Uh, so hmm, what comes to mind? Oh, well, the only thing really that makes sense is merely labeled by mind. Um, it's a miracle of God. From a Buddhist point of view, that would apply to the last one. It's not arisen by a cause. It's not arisen. It's, it's costlessly arisen because... If God, God is not seen as a cause of it, God created, yes, we say created, but cause in the sense of um, substantial cause and cooperative conditions. I mean, what would God be? Only the cooperative condition? Um, that's kind of like the most important condition is the substantial condition. So it's like, and and do you need God for that if you have the cooperative conditions such as water, etc.? So it's really like God is not a cause, um, and so you and then you don't need water and fertilizer, etc. If God could just create it, so it, it would be like costless production, really, if if it was created by God.
Anyway, it leads to a lot of questions like who created God? Was God always there? Is God permanent, impermanent? Uh, if God is permanent, then how can something permanent give rights to something impermanent? Anyway, there are quite a few um, um, logical arguments that we don't need to go into into to details on but the point is we're not just saying or being merely labeled by mind because well i can't think of anything better no we need to check first of all leaving aside being merely labeled by mind not going as deep as that that is more subtle being dependent on mind first of all how about being dependent on the mind does this uh, object over there, this the seed and so forth that appears to be over there, is it dependent on the mind or not? Could it exist without a mind? So logically, does it exist? When I say objectively here, I'm I'm using it in a in a in a coarser kind of sense. Does it depend on the mind in general, just appearing to the mind as this as this vatantric has, for instance, uh, s stress? So it's dependent on mind or not? And I, I guess we can come to the conclusion, yes, it's dependent on the mind. Without a mind, I mean, without a mind perceiving it, is it there? I mean, how can we say it's there without anyone perceiving it? I mean, when I talk about reality, it's the reality I perceive. And then there's your reality. And is there anything beyond what can be perceived by the mind? It seems that way. But when we really analyze, no, actually what would that be? So saying that, and of course, to look at the object itself, I mean, we have a sense, okay, there's this seed that then becomes a sunflower. But you remember, I, I gave you the example of taking photographs of the seed at every stage as it transforms, it becomes a sunflower. If you look at all these moments, is there any is there anything from the side of the seat that's saying I'm a seat, unless we label it as such, unless we label it a cause, we labeled a, a result. Is there anything found from the side of the object? But is that labeling? Does it make sense in terms of our conventions? Does it make sense or not? So the seedness cannot be found from the side of the object. The sunflowerness cannot be found from the side of the object. So there's nothing intrinsic within the object. And still, based on how we use terminology, based on, um, on many different aspects, when we label, where we say, oh, the sunflower is arising, it makes sense, right? It is dependent on the mind having these thoughts. But... This is not a random kind of like making it up. No, there's a basis. There's a basis to that, although that is also merely labeled, but based on objects appearing to the mind, based on that, we say it is a seed, it is a sunflower and so forth, right? So oftentimes in, in the Buddhist text, phenomena being dependently arisen a synonym that is used is phenomena appearing. They go as far as saying they're mere appearances. Beyond appearing to a mind, nothing can exist. So again, the importance of the mind comes in. And still, we're not saying that there are no external phenomena, because conventionally we talk of external phenomena, but labeled as external phenomena. So labeled by the mind. Anyway, I've gone, I've, I've gone through this again and again, and there's this whole material on just emptiness and dependent arising that I, um, that I, that I made available in the beginning, that I um, passed on to you in the beginning. So I talk a lot more about labeling. But in conclusion, in, in to conclude this question or to wrap it up, basically, well, it makes sense being merely labeled by the mind. It makes sense being a miracle of God doesn't from a buddhist point of view it doesn't make sense so we apply logic we apply the one of the tools to understanding reality and that being logic so they're not the same because one you can prove and the other one you can't
So the where's the improvement? One you can prove. That's a huge improvement, right? Okay. Anyway, but uh, that's the whole point to understand that it's merely labeled. That is really subtle and very hard to understand. And that's, of course, the whole purpose of this um, study here. All right. And now comes a question that I don't, it's not a question, it's more a statement or more like an observation. I don't totally understand it, but I still thought it was maybe interesting and it was good to, to share because there are some interesting aspects. So here, Tau Seti, or I misspelled his name, Tau Ceti, I wrote Tau Seti. Anyway, these are his personal thoughts about the fourth verse. So he's not sure he can clearly express this, but he actually prefers the Garfield translation because there's the term power more in focus. Something resonates here because I do have a picture of ocean waves in mind when I read this. Okay, so I've copied the fourth verse and it doesn't have the word power in it. So, but I guess what he means is like it's this it's it kind of suggests power, it implies power. I don't know. Action does not have conditions. There's no action without conditions and so forth. Really, all that is saying here is you can't have an arising of something without being inseparably linked to conditions, right? So it's dependent on each other. These conditions cannot exist inherently. This, this action of arising doesn't exist inherently. But on a conventional level, you can't have one without the other. This is what it's saying. And then he talks about this fun fact that the ocean waves don't move, but water does. Now, um, first I was like, hmm, I don't know whether I'm going to go into this, but I've read it a few times. And that's just also, that's also part of our practice, I feel, just to train our mind to understand better where another person comes from. You know, the first time I read it, I didn't understand it. The second time was better. The third time was better. So I read it a few times. And I slowly got a sense of what he means. And I got something out of it, though I'm not sure I can totally follow um, his thoughts. But I, I still get a sense, yeah, he's really given it some thought. He's really uh, reflected on that. And, and that itself is, is, is really important. So he talked about the ocean waves that don't move. I remember I talked about this in one text and I just cannot remember which text it was. I checked the Pramanavatika, it's not in there. I checked some of the German translations I did. I couldn't, I did, I couldn't find it. Um, I put it in a footnote, exactly that, because in one text it talks about this, the, the waves of an ocean. It looks as if the water was moving, but the water stays in the same place. Instead, it's this energy moving through it. Maybe Gila, you remember um I, I i yeah which text that was i couldn't find it anyway I, I, it, it's in the buddhist text it talks exactly about that that the ocean that the the movement that the ripples in the lake or whatever it is it's not the water it's not that the water moves forward it's just the movement okay it's like an optical illusion in other words um anyway so he rose rise about that that the water stays in the same place but the moving, the action itself is moving forward. I don't think the action is moving, but the energy, it's like the action that is happening. So I don't think, oh yeah, you could actually say the action is moving in the sense of this movement, it moves forward. So it's like this wave going up and this going upwards, that moves forward. Okay. In nature, the wind gives the moving energy. Okay, so here the causes are such and such. Never mind. So the wind is only a medium for the power. He talks a lot about the medium here. Not sure I understand. But um, yeah, I don't want to go into this in too, too much detail. But what I like is this example of the wave in general. Because there's so many factors involved. We have an optical illusion. It seems like the water in and of itself is moving forward when actually it isn't. Isn't It's actually, there's this, uh, this energy that goes through the water through causes and conditions, and it needs a medium to do so. And in that sense, taking it back to the 
cause, which is the seed and the sprout, there is this, okay, there is this action. And it feels a bit like that this seed is transforming into something else. So it's like the seed um, still retains that seedness to some degree, but it it it's like it's a seed all the time. Let's say these moments when the seed is slightly transforming to then become a sprout. So it's the same seed, but it's actually just changing from the outside. That's It seems like the seedness is transported from moment to moment. When in actuality, that totally separate moment, we just constantly call each moment seed. But the first moment is not the second and so forth. But we have the sense there's something inherent that moves on. I, I, I definitely have that sense. There's something intrinsic in that object that is carried on. And, you know, I catch myself thinking this with people as well. My mom has a friend who has uh, Alzheimer's, who's got dementia. And the sense that there's still this other person inside her who's now no longer, I mean, the way I know her, this person, she's still somewhere inside. My mother talks along these lines. She, she keeps saying, she's still in there. We just can't access her. So as if there was still this well, soul, for lack of a better word, there's something there within this person, and that is just carried on. And from the outside, we just cannot access it. So it's a bit like this wave. It seems to be the water. Water is moving forward, and and yeah, it changes, but there's this essence left. That is our sense of inherent existence. In actuality, they're just moments of oxygen and hydrogen changing all the time and it seems like this whole entity moves on but it doesn't so this is why i like this example baby i'm stretching it a little bit but i want to co convey the sense we have because of this our sense of inherent existence that when the seed slowly changes it's like the seed is the same in and of itself and it's just changing clothes right it's outside is changing but its essence is the same that's the sense we have there's a sense that me my essence was there when i was five years old the sense that was me that was my essence and i've carried it on until this day and so outside, I kind of change, but this essence is, essence is the same. Well, that essence is another word for something inherent. And that is what Nagarjuna is saying is not there. I call, I call the seed a seed from moment to moment because on a conventional level, well, it still, it, is, it still qualifies to be called a seed. There's no essence that is carried on. And in my case, neither. There's no essence that is carried on. Right? I just, just now maybe. realized what well, all you all the um, all the things that Edward, Jimmy, Ty, uh, you said now. Now everything is in the place. And now I started to understand uh, what you're teaching about what Nagajuna <laughs> said. <laughs> Oh, wow. How nice to you. I still don't understand it, but you did, Dali. Please explain me. <laughs> I'm kidding, but good, good. Okay. Anyway, okay. So having said all this, therefore, I've, I found this really helpful. I found this point, although I'm still struggling with this a little bit about all the details, but I, I get a sense he's really gone deep into this, and I like the examples he used. Anyway, all right. That's it for today. I've really stretched it today. Um, okay. So let's then go to the material. What is really interesting is, and we've spoken about this, the lower schools. Remember last time we've talked about exactly these moments of the seat then. We had five moments of the seat, just to remind you. And in the lower schools, they would say, it's only the last moment, just before the sprout arises, that arising actually takes place. 
And that is really bizarre. According to all Buddhist schools, they would say in each moment, the seed produces the sprout. Each moment produces the sprout because it's the definition of a cause. It produces. So they would actually all have to say if it's the cause of the sprout, they all produce the sprout. They're all producing it. I don't think there's any disagreement on that. But they disagree on the sprout arising or not. Does the sprout arise during those first four moments? And in the lower schools, they say no. It only arises just shortly before it has arisen. Shortly before this, the sprout has come into existence, a moment before it arises. I, I can, I, that also makes sense to me because there's the sense, well, before there wasn't a sprout, wasn't to be seen all this time. Okay, it was being produced, but it was so far off. And then one moment, at some point, then you have the sprout. Here you have the sprout. So the arising could have just been a moment earlier. Because we expect if there's a rising, there's something to be seen. However, um, according to the Prasangika school, the arising of the sprout and the producing of the sprout are mutually dependent. Yes, merely labeled. But merely labeled doesn't mean we just make it up. There is a basis. There is a qualified basis for saying so. Now, the qualified basis is, are these moments here in time? Thinking of all these moments, we have to think here. We cannot think of just the present moment, but we have to think of a continuum of moments that are relevant for the moment when there is the sprout, when this comes into existence. So it's when, when we define producing, it's making something, being responsible for its existence. And so this is happening during those five moments of the seed. That's exactly what's happening. They're all responsible. They perform the function of um, moving, moving closer to the sprout. In other words, or they, they perform the function of bringing the sprout into existence, for lack of a better word, right? So for producing the sprout. And if there's something producing the sprout, it better be arising, right? You can't. So you always have, especially in the present Gika school, these two aspects. Um, two aspects. So for instance, Jadu Rinpoche likes to uh, stress this a lot. For instance, when someone murders me, Okay, when someone murders me, when someone applies this karmic action, if someone performs the karmic action of murdering me, I must have created the karmic action that gives rise to me being murdered. You see, you also have these two aspects. So Rinpoche often talks about this, how we usually just see the cause in the person performing, for instance, the action of killing me or of stealing something from me. We forget that you need both sides. You also need the karmic cause that was created to now receive this karmic result. You see, you have a karmic cause. You have, no, so you have a person being like a cooperative condition here for that karmic experience to take place. So you have both aspects, but for that, you also needed to have a karmic cause. You had the karmic cause to now have a karmic result. So it's slightly different to what I said before, but you always need both aspects. You need the perpetrator that caused a certain experience, but you also need the person who experiences that, who also created the cause to have that experience. So in that way, you have both sides. Here, which is different, it's not, we're not talking about karma here, but you need the producing of a result and the arising of the result. Again, you need both. It doesn't make sense that the sprout is not arising during the first, second, and third moment. Now, some would argue, some, if you now debate this with someone from the uh, 
someone who follows the, I mean, from a point of view of the Prasangika school, you may find the argument that this contradicts Chandakirti. This contradicts Chandakirti because there is actually a passage in Chandakirti's text. Okay, I'll show you, I, I prepared it. In Chandakirti's text, which says, for as you contend, that which is arising is about to arise, so does not yet or exist. So here he seems to be saying arising takes place only shortly before something has come into existence, about to arise, right? Like during the indirect cause, during the indirect cause, it's not about to arise. About to arise means like it's just before it's coming into existence, okay? So this is an argument someone would give. Well, Chandakirti even talked about this, that arising only happens a moment earlier. But we shouldn't forget, it says, for as you contend, who is Chandakirti talking to here? The lower schools. He's talking to the Svatantrikas. He's talking to the Svatantrikas who don't say cause and effect are dependent on each other. Right, it's this. If you read the whole passage here, the Svatantrikas uh, give this explanation. Oh, I don't know. I don't. Is it this? Yeah, I think it is the Svatantrikas. Yes. Anyway, so yes. Yeah, so anyway, it's not the Prasangikas. He's not arguing with the Prasangikas here. Um, oh no, no, he's 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 arguing with the Samkhyas here. Uh, happening at the same time. Anyway, never mind. He's not. He's not arguing with the. Um, he's not arguing with the um, Prasangikas. No, he's arguing with those who do not assert that cause and effect are dependent on each other. Therefore, do not assert that producing something and that something arising that they are mutually dependent. Um, and so, therefore, that they happen at the same time, that when something is being produced, that something has to also arise. So, for them, for as you content, uh, that which is arising is about to arise. So, that would be the argument that could be given here anyway. So, I just wanted to share that with you because in the debate, this, this quote could be given. Um, but having said all this, we talked about this last time. So the fundamental wisdom, it reads here in this context, again, independence on these, there's a rising. I don't remember how much I did last time. Oh, I did all this. Okay. I read all this. So now here Nagarjuna is saying exactly what I just explained. Uh, a condition is only a condition if a rising of the result takes place. Because if something arises independence on them because something arises independence on certain causes and conditions therefore they are declared to be conditions if if doesn't if it doesn't arise as long as the thing doesn't arise how can there be its non conditions so you definitely need the arising of something the expression are declared here indicates that Nagarjuna disagrees with the view of the Satantrikas, for he holds that a result must arise at the time of both its direct and indirect conditions. Okay, so it's not sufficient to describe a condition simply as that independence upon which a result arises. Also as part of the, I don't remember how far we got last time. Um, Hope I'm not reading it again, although you've already read it. Um, does anyone remember? It's part of the explanation of verse four. It was noted that a condition is a condition only if it does not lack the action of arising. That is, oh yes. So condition is only a condition if a arising takes place. It has to take place in each moment that if it's of one nature within the responsible for the arising of its result. This is why by both direct and indirect conditions possess or have the arising of their result. That is, they're in, 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 in inseparably linked to the arisings. For if they didn't, that is, if they weren't of the same nature as and didn't facilitate the arising of their result, not facilitate as a cause, but 
being of one nature with the arising of their result, there wouldn't be its conditions. Therefore, something is called a condition only in virtue of possessing or being inseparably linked with the action with the arising of its result. And if it's not a condition, then a result cannot arise from it, just as mustard oil cannot arise from sand. Yes. So this is the case, the case of the sprout and the seed here. So in the case of the example of the seed and the sprout, this means that each of the direct and indirect conditions of the sprout have and are thus in, in, inextricably linked to the arising of the sprout. So in other words, with every action we perform, the result, the experience is arising. Even if it's arising, doesn't, does it mean that the experience definitely has to come into existence? No, it can, of course, be purified. So in the lower schools that say if something is arising, it has to come into existence. In the Prasangika school, they say, no, even if it's arising, it doesn't have to come into existence. Just as if you produce something, that which you produce doesn't have to come into existence. Right now, if out of anger, I harm another person, I'm producing the causes uh, I'm producing. I'm producing the experience of suffering, of future suffering. Does that mean that I'm actually? I actually have to experience that future suffering? No. I can purify the karma, this karmic condition. I can purify it. So even though I'm producing, I'm producing it now. There's no certainty that I. Even though I'm producing a certain type of suffering, there's no certainty that this ex suffering will come into existence. If there's no certainty then, then why, if there is arising, if, if something is arising, in the lower school they say, if something is arising, it has to come into existence. That's their whole argument. They say, arising takes place at the last moment of, of the cause of the sprout when it's certain that nothing can stop that sprout coming into existence. So the argument is, argument is, if it's arising, then there's nothing that can stop it. Well, why is that not true for the producing? Okay. All right. Anyway, how much do we have left? Yeah, it's not much. A little bit. Okay. I guess so we're going to do the meditation now. Yes, I want to do the meditation now. So I apologize. I think I've repeated myself what I said last time. I pretty much said it again. So I hope it was um, okay. Anyway, um, one more thing before we start meditation, because we pretty much um, stop afterwards. How about next week? Because I'm aware there's a course with Venerable Lopsangs and... There's Yom Kippur. Now, my question is, do you want to postpone it uh, to a different day? I I'll leave it up to you. I mean, having class is not a, 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 a problem. The preparation is the problem. So anyway, we can discuss it later on. But um, yeah, as I said, right now, it's a, it's a really difficult time. There's no time. Therefore, um, we can have class. Um, even without new materials. So I would ask you to prepare questions. And we can also propose, uh, postpone class. We can put it on a different day to be able to deal with this um, celebration. That, well, well, not just celebration, but also the fact that you probably have to... Um, that, you have, that you're attending this course. Anyway, we can discuss it at a later point, but you could already maybe um, discuss it among each other and then let me know. Monday, okay. Monday is, uh, is Yom Kippur, so Monday is not, I don't think Monday is possible. Okay, great. Then Monday is out, so just let me know which other day works for everyone else, whether we should uh, do it on a different day, whatever works best. Okay, great. All right. So let's do a meditation then. Okay. Again, take a moment to let go of any disruptive thoughts. Let go of any thoughts of the past and the future. 
and just be in the present with the breathing. Then let's go back to the river and the toxin that is produced by bacteria. So first, let's take a moment to get in touch with our instinctive sense of something being inherent in that compound. That we call poisonous or We call a toxin. Like a, an essence. of being in and of itself harmful. But such an essence, of course, if we search for it, within the compound. Cannot be found. Since it is in relation to a future reaction. To that substance. That we label it toxin. or medicine. If that chemical actually helps another living being to overcome a disease, So from its own sight, it's neither a toxin nor a medicine. But 
but in relation to some beings it is medicine and in relation to others it is toxin thus it's merely labeled as both And this can be applied to all phenomena. Particular to the eye. That is the reason for all our actions. From the perspective of my mind, When it has the thought, I, in dependence on my mind, my body. It's the I. It's most important. The center of the universe. From the perspective of countless other minds, Likewise label on the basis of my eye, of my mind and my body. My eye is other. And not the center of the universe. Which is why it doesn't make sense to act in a way as if my happiness is more important than the happiness of others. In particular, since believing that my happiness is more important and ignoring the happiness of others in that process is the main cause of all 
my trouble. So to conclude this meditation, let's take a moment to focus on whatever insights we've gained and allow this to go deeper to the level of our emotions, our feelings. And then let's dedicate whatever virtue, whatever positive potential we accumulated today so that it doesn't get lost but becomes a cause for our own future enlightenment by thinking, may this for the benefit of all sentient beings become a cause for my own enlightenment. And may in the meantime also cause our spiritual masters like His Holiness the Dalai Lama and all the other great lamas to have an extremely long, stable and healthy life so that we're never without a lama, an inspiration who guides us and helps us to go on. And of course, may it also affect everyone else around us. How those who are sick, physically, mentally, to quickly go get better. So may I help Geshe Punso, Tali Lubin, and the pastor who asked the question, who was burned by fire, to quickly, quickly get better and be free from their illness. But it may also help those who suffer mentally, in particular, suffer from loneliness, exhaustion, depression, and other mental conditions to soon overcome all their mental pain and find true peace and satisfaction. With this in mind, let's recite the dedication prayers. Through the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chinresik, Denzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the precious Bodhi mind, not yet born, arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. Okay, thank you. Um, could you hear the dog just now? Did you hear the dog? Oh, good. No. <laughs> okay, no, good, good. Okay, <laughs> it was a very loud dog next to my room. Okay, good. Well no problem <laughs> all right so anyway have a great 
well, remaining week. And I'll see you probably next week. So just let me know yeah. what day we thank should have you. class. I will speak with you later. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very thank much. You. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Dalit. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.